Hi, good to see everyone. You know, we need to let Spencer and Peter get out a little bit more often. I mean, <laughs> what a great job. We're so proud of our media team and thankful for all that everyone does here. It's so good to see all of you here today. Are you glad to be in church today? Come on. Stand to your feet, Brother Raman. Fize Raman, who we support. Good News India, all the way from India. Dream Centers in India. We love that man. Bless you, my friend. Thank you for being with us here today. We are in a series called Changed. And uh, so we're right in the middle. In fact, uh, I think next week is when we end it. But, but we are talking about life being changed by what God does to each one of us when we come to know him. He changes who we are. He changes our disposition, where we're going. We no longer are going to hell. We're going to heaven. Amen. How many are happy about that? That's right. And, and, and he puts his... He puts his spirit within us, and he puts his nature within us as well, which is a pretty awesome thing. So we've been talking about that the last several weeks, and today uh, I'm, I'm going to speak about something. I'll talk a little bit about being changed at the end of the service, but uh, I, I have a truth here that I want to give. Uh, I've done this before several years ago, but I really feel like this is something for today. We just came out of Easter. Easter is an exciting holiday. We have all of these great holidays throughout the year where all of our families get together. Hopefully you had a big family event and we get our families together to find out just how much weirder everybody has gotten over the last year. How many know what I'm talking about? It's the truth. You know, and that's the reality. If you look at it, Brooke and I just went to New York City we stood, we watch people. You can't help but just watch people all the time. And guess what conclusion we came to? There's a lot of weird people in the world, right? A bunch of them live in New York, but they don't all live in New York. A lot of them live in Phoenix. In fact, we've got a lot of weird people right here. It's the truth. You know what? I've come to the conclusion that at, at, that at some point, every single person is weird. Every single person is flawed. Every person is odd in some way. Strange, maybe even downright creepy, okay? And, and, and you know, you might appear normal on the outside, but inside, you've got this inner weirdo going on that people are just going, whoa. Let me, I'm curious, would anybody here admit that, okay? Tell the truth, shame the devil. Just admit some weird people, weird things going on. Now, you may th- let me just tell you personally then. If you don't think it's weird or you're th- think about th- I can't stand ketchup, okay? That's not a big deal. People don't like tomatoes you can't, or allergic. But I love mustard on my hamburgers. I, I was in high school, went to Whataburger almost every day, and I just love that. Couldn't handle ketchup on anything. It made me sick. Unless, now, unless, and here's the other thing. If you eat a hot dog with ketchup on it, you just ain't right with God, man. You got issues, you got major issues. I'm telling you, it's a mustard thing, you know? Well, I, there's a place in Kansas City, all of that said, there's a place I grew up as a little kid eating at a hamburger joint called High Boy. And at High Boy, the hamburgers all just have ketchup on them. That's it. There's no money. It's just ketchup. And I love them. They're like my favorite hamburger, but I can't stand ketchup. That's just weird. You know, I've got t shirts. Now, so you may not think this is weird, but I've got T-shirts that are over 40 years old. It's true, you know, and I can't keep them in the house because my wife would take them to the Goodwill or to Thrift to Thrive. But I, I pay hundreds of dollars for a storage unit that I can put them in a bin and store them. And if I ever want to see one, I can go look at it, you know. I mean, you, you may think, now that may not be weird. I don't know, you may think that's weird, but that's kind of the way it is. Everybody has their own thing, their idiosyncrasy, don't they? And, 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 and I realize that normal families probably don't have some of that stuff. Uh, they probably do, and, and, uh, and, and they, but, but at least not the T-shirts. Here's my point. I want you to write this down. Take some pictures. Write some things down today. That's what this is going to be, just a teaching, okay? Here it is. Write this down. Everyone is weird, okay? 
turn to your neighbor, just say it. Everyone is weird. There you go. Don't point. Pointing is not allowed. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this equation on the screen right here. Everyone is weird. Everyone has family. And families are weird, which equals what? Tension. That's exactly right. How many of you would say, I have someone in my family who's weird? Lift your hand right now. Okay. Now, I just got to tell you, if you did not lift your hand, you're the weird one. Okay? Just so you know. Okay? And you think it's all cool. You're doing great. You know, I just got to tell you, you got another holiday coming up, and everyone in the family is thinking about you. Wonder what weird Uncle Al is going to do this year. You know, what's going on with him? It's reality, but, but, but the reality is we have tension because of families. We hurt one another within a family union. And I find this kind of odd, but, but it's, it's interesting. We are quicker to forgive total strangers than we are people in our own family. Have you noticed that? There's a lot of truth to that. And, and, and I mean, we forgive strangers we'll never see again for things that they do. And, and the people that we love the most, we have the hardest time forgiving. The Bible just makes a beautiful picture of this. You can just see it. Starting in the book of Genesis, you find out the people are messy and they're weird. And I know everyone here has read the book of Genesis. It is the book that is most read by all of us because we go through that year Bible reading thing. We get through Genesis, right? And then we get into Exodus. And by the time we get to Leviticus, it's the 15th sacrifice on the 15th hill by the 16th priest. And you go, I'm vegetarian. And you just move on. But in Genesis, there's just no warm up. right? It, it, like, like there's really spiritual people in Genesis, right? I mean, these are... No, it looks crazy. It's like a crazy house. Look at this. This is the Bible right from the very beginning. The challenging people start. I mean, Cain, he gets jealous of his brother Abel. And what's he do? He kills him. That's right out of the gate of the book of Genesis. And then you've got Noah. God said that Noah was the most righteous man on the earth. In fact, he chose to start all of the races with just him. Okay, but what does Noah do when he gets off of the ark? He gets drunk and he gets naked, okay? You don't see that. Remember that on your Sunday school flannel board? Remember all that? Yeah, of course. You didn't see that. And then you've got Lot, okay? Lot, the the nephew of Abraham. Lot lives in Sodom. Some angels come to visit him, messengers. And they are at his house as guests. And the men of Sodom come knocking on the doors and says, give us your guests, so, basically, so we can violate them. That's what it was. It was such debauchery in that town. And so, I mean, it went right from PG-13 to rated R here, okay? And now it gets even beyond it because he says, he says no, why don't you take my daughters instead? And, and, and if you haven't read or don't remember, after that, sometime later, the, the daughters of Lot get him drunk And he impregnates the daughters. That's in the Bible. That's why you don't see any pictures of Lot on Father's Day cards. They're just not there, okay? You just don't see it. And then, sorry. And then, and then you've got Abraham and Isaac, right? Now, Isaac, who plays favorites between Jacob and Esau, his kids, they're twins, he plays favorites, and what happens? Those kids become bitter enemies, right? Till the day they die. Then Jacob, like his dad, mistreats his or treats his sons differently. He favors one over the rest, Joseph. And so what do the brothers do? They take Joseph, put him into slavery. I mean, it is crazy in the book of Genesis. And then you get into the marriages. They're just dysfunctional. You you see problems everywhere. This is just kind of a mix of Sunday School Survivor and Jerry Springer all in one, okay? Now, why does God allow that? These are the fathers of the faith. Why would he allow the dirty laundry to be exposed to everyone so that everyone could see? Why would he do that? Well, could it be 
that God maybe wants you and I to know thousands of years later that nobody's normal, nobody's perfect, and, and, and everybody's just a little bit weird. And so that stuff doesn't become important as what is most important. And what is most important? Well, Jesus was asked that question. What's the most important thing in life? And here's what he says. Teacher, which is the most important commandment uh, 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 in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let me give you a little context here. 613 commandments in the Old Testament, 613. And I like to think maybe this was some middle school kid coming up and he's got his big Torah test coming up. And so he's just trying to get a shortcut to the right answer. So he asked Jesus this question, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus says, let me make it easy for you. I'll just summarize it. I'll give you the most important one. Love God. That's the most important, love God. And equally important is to love your neighbor. So what we have to realize here before we move on is these are not independent of one another. You've got to catch this or nothing makes sense in this process of forgiveness. And that's what we're talking about today. These are not independent commandments of one another. You don't love God and then harbor resentment against other people. It just doesn't work that way. You don't come to church and worship this morning and then leave here and hold grudges against other people. It just doesn't work that way. You don't come in and say, I love you, Lord, but I hate my family. Let me tell you, that is wrong. That is wrong on many levels, including my singing. I get it, okay? That's the way it works. But we learn that we choose, when we choose forgiveness, and remember, forgiveness is a choice It's a choice. We choose forgiveness. And when we do that, it's actually choosing freedom. See, to be right with God and to be right with other people requires that we develop a skill that's that's gonna be needed all throughout our life. And that skill is forgiveness. Now, the reality before God is this. I can have a right relationship with God when I seek forgiveness. And I can have a right relationship with God when I offer forgiveness forgiveness. And this is especially difficult in the context of family. Now, why is that? Because families don't go anywhere, right? They're the thing that wouldn't leave. See, when you have tension with a stranger, they just up and leave and they're gone. You'll never see them again. But when you have tension with the family, families don't go anywhere. I mean, just your immediate family. They're at home. They're there. You know, and and if you're married, think about the complexity of all of this. You got one sinner who marries another sinner for their entire lives. And then they create these little sinnerettes, right? It was just, just like an incubator for tension, right? I mean, marriage is crazy sometimes. You've heard me tell the story. There's a guy watching TV, And as he was watching TV, his wife comes up behind him and hits him in the back of the head. Boom. What was that all about? She said, I was washing your clothes. And in your pocket, I found the name of a woman, Mary Lou. Why do you have the name of another woman in your pocket? He goes, oh, honey. He said, that's I I was at the the racetrack. And Mary Lou is the horse that I bet on in the fifth race. That's what that is. She goes, oh, I knew there was an explanation. Thank you for clearing that up. Sorry, I doubted you. Two weeks later, he's watching TV. She comes in, smacks him in the back of the head. He goes, what was that for? She said, your horse just called. (laughs) You know, there's a potential for hurt and anger in our lives all the time, and we need forgiveness. Raise your hand if you're a parent. If you're a parent, look at that. If you're a parent, you could be angry 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nora Ephron, author, she wrote this. She said, when your children are teenagers, it's important to have a dog so that someone in the house is happy to see you. That's the way it works. You know pain. You know, hurt and betrayal. 
Yeah, it just seems more intense though when it comes from family, doesn't it? That heartbreak, that stress and the damage from those who are closest to us. Yet Jesus said this about it. He, he just makes it very clear. He says, when there is stuff between you and somebody else, especially those that are closest to you, you got to take care of that as quickly as you possibly can. Not later, not someday in the future. He says, fix it right now. Look at Matthew chapter 5. He says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. That's the words of Jesus. What's he saying? He's saying, it's like, you know, you come to church to celebrate and to worship. Most of us do. I'm going to worship, celebrate, hear a word, you know, be challenged, you know, build me up. That's, that's why I'm going. That's, that's job one. No. Jesus is saying, job one is for you to make things right with people that are around you before you ever come in and celebrate and ever get into your worship and get into your church thing. In fact, he says, that's more important, getting things right with the people around you, than any of the church thing that goes on. Don't even walk in the door if you've got a problem with somebody else. That's heavy, but I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Leave it at the altar and leave and go get things right. So, with all that in mind, let's talk a little bit about, about uh, what it is, what happens to us when we don't forgive. There's consequences. There's things that happen when we don't forgive. And as a pastor, I've seen this for 45 years as a pastor. And all these pastors, they've seen it so much what happens when people just kind of shelve that and think they're just going to get beyond that and not even have to worry about forgiveness in their lives? Look at what happens. First is, we disobey God's instruction. You may want to take some pictures of this or write this down. We disobey God's instructions. And some of that, you look at that and you go, that's not a big deal. I disobey God's instructions all the time. I don't even care what God thinks. If that's you, thank you for being here. If you're watching online, thank you for being here. We're going to get to you in a minute. But we're going to shelve you on this one. And for the rest of us who have a relationship with Jesus and what God thinks about us is important, you just have to know, listen, it's not, we, it's, it's not a suggestion here. It's a commandment to us to forgive. See, if we've aligned ourselves with the teaching of Jesus, we actually have to care about this. See, and, 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 and it's, so, it's not a suggestion from God, it's a command, forgive. And some of you say, but Brad, you know, I, I would, but I just don't feel like it all the time. I just, I, I just don't feel like going and doing that. It's gonna take so much and, and, and I really need to feel that if I'm going to, let me tell you, and I've heard a lot of people say that. Let me tell you, you're wrong, okay? Bottom line, because forgiveness is a choice of obedience. It's a choice of obedience, I've also heard it said that forgiveness is a choice of freedom, but it's a choice of obedience. Unforgiveness is a choice of disobedience. Here's another way to say it. Forgiveness isn't a feeling, it's a decision. I don't think you got that. Forgiveness isn't a feeling, it's a decision. It's a decision. Obeying God, not based on how I feel, it's an act of my will. And I wanna be clear about this. When it comes to forgiveness in my life, personally, I never feel like forgiving when I'm hurt. I never feel like it. Oh, but Brad, you're a pastor. Hey, listen, I'm telling you, it's not easy to forgive because I'm a pastor. It's hard to forgive because I'm a human being, right? And God desires that we are people that are characterized by forgiveness, not emotion, okay? So that's the first one. Forgiveness is a choice of obedience. Now let's get back to everybody. Everybody else join us, okay? Because these are universal truths we're gonna talk about. What happens when you don't forgive? Number two is when I don't forgive, my anger is intensified. 
My anger is intensified. See, most people don't think about this, but when you don't forgive, you are just taking that hurt and that pain and you're jamming it way down inside and fitting it inside in a place in your soul where maybe even sometime you, you forget about it and forget it's even there. But if you haven't dealt with it, you're actually a walking time bomb just waiting for that to go off. That anger to just blow sometime in your life. You're like a, a, a human porcupine and you don't notice it about yourself. You know, kind of like when you didn't notice that you were weird, you know. It's the same type thing. But you have this unresolved tension and you push it down. And the funny thing is you can see it on people's face, can't you? When they're living that way. It's just a terrible thing. It's this lack of forgiveness, what it does, it fuels our anger. You could go off at any time. Let me get to the third one. Here's what happens, the third thing. And there's many others, but these are just three. Here's the third result when I don't forgive. I actually relive painful experiences. Relive the pain. You relive the hurt of others. And what's interesting about this is the other person, they don't feel a single thing. They're like John Travolta, man, it's Saturday Night Fever. They're out dancing at a disco. Do they have discos? I don't know, but they're doing all of that. It's okay. They're not even thinking about you. And here you are. You're chained to that person. And you're chained to your own sewer. And the sewer of unforgiveness, that stench is going through your veins and it's wrapping around your heart and, and, and it's just making you look ugly. I've heard it said this, and you've heard it many times. Drinking or lack of forgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies, right? See, the bottom line to all this result of lack of forgiveness is, is that there's consequences. There's a price to pay when we don't forgive. There's a big price tag, personally, but also spiritually. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says it this way. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Now, I really didn't want to go there because I want you all to like me. <laughs> I want you to go, man, that guy is so cute. and He's so funny and he's so this, that, and the other. You know what? But these aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus, okay? Look, and Jesus says this, and, and, and what, he, what he means here is he's saying that the lack of forgiveness somehow, and I don't even understand this, my lack of forgiveness has spiritual consequences. And when I live my life with a lack of forgiveness, I'm not living my life the way God designed for me to live and to, the, the way that God designed for life to be lived, and neither are you. This lack of forgiveness, it damages our primary relationships. It wounds our spiritual life. It interferes with every relationship we have in some way or another. So when I'm sitting across the table with someone who has damaged relationships in their life, we're drinking coffee together, and, 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 and forgiveness is not even on their agenda. In fact, they're saying to me, Brad, I can't forgive that person. You know what they're usually saying to me? What they're really saying is, I won't forgive that person. I won't forgive, no matter what you say, I'm not gonna forgive that person. Because listen, forgiveness is a choice and something has to change within us to see that choice take place. We've gotta be changed. Not just our disposition of going from hell to heaven. We've gotta make some big changes in our lives to look more and more like Jesus as we're going through this life and to enjoy the life that God has made for us and presented for every one of us to have the most full and abundant life. And unforgiveness is not on that list. I won't forgive, but forgiveness is a choice. And when you forgive, it's choosing freedom. Unforgiveness is choosing bondage and chains. So with all that in mind, okay, Let's move on. With all that in mind, I want to get very, very practical here, okay? So before we leave, I want every one of you to be able to take something with you. And here's what I want to do is to challenge everyone in this room, all of us, to go to a higher level of loving in our lives. So let's be very real here, okay? As a pastor, when I've counseled people and done all of that, and they say, and, and right now we have our wellness 
ministry that goes on on Wednesday nights that deals with all of this stuff heavily. So if you want to know more about it, you can be involved in that on Wednesday nights. It's powerful. We're seeing a lot of people that are involved and touched and their lives are being changed. But, but, but if, I, if I'm talking with someone and, and, and they're saying, you know, how, how do I do this? I know I need to forgive, but how do I begin this process of forgiveness? And maybe that's you here today. I know I need to do it, but how do I do it? Well, let me give you something very practical. Many ways, but let me just give you these three steps that you can do that will get you on the road to forgiveness. Are you still with me? How many are still with me? Okay, good. All right. Just wanted to see if you were alive. All right. Here's what I would say first to someone who's struggling with this. I would say this to them. You have to identify who has hurt you and make a list. If you're going to receive forgiveness, you have to identify who has hurt you and make a list. Get out a piece of paper and write their names down. It may be one name. It may be a bunch of names. I'm asking you to make a list because it might be dad, mom, or your stepmom, your stepdad, your ex-spouse. person could be dead, alive. It doesn't matter. Write their name down. It also applies to people outside of the family as well, okay? It could be a person who abused you. It could be a teacher who embarrassed you. It could be the clown at Walmart who scared you. Was that just me? <laughs> scary clown day? Okay, scary clown day? Okay, all right. But you do, you, you do that. You just write the names down. And, and why the list? Okay, because I, I think a list, here's what it does. It sheds light on our own personal denial when we do that. You know, so when there's pain in somebody's life, I can often say, who is it that you haven't forgiven? No, Brad, I'm clean with everybody. Let's dig a little deeper. And we dig a little deeper, we find out that somebody's just been living in denial and pushing it down. And once again, we got problems. You might as well write their name down and just know who it is that's causing you to disobey God by not forgiving, right? So write it down. All right, and then number two, determine what that person owes you. You got their name down there. Now, beside that, put what they owe you. What do they owe you? Because Brad, you know, my husband owes me an apology. My wife, she owes me an explanation. My son, he owes me respect. My dad owes me a childhood because he worked all the time and, you know, never tucked me in bed at night, you know. That clown at Walmart, he owes me a brand new pair of underwear, you know. And uh, that's a, I mean, whatever it is, you got to write it down. And what I'm asking you to do is just like if we were sitting across the table from one another, I would say, what's been taken from you? Identify that. Now, if you were to go buy a self-help book down at Barnes & Noble or on Amazon.com, you, 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 could, you could find secular books about forgiveness everywhere. But you know how they kind of deal with it? They say, it, 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 release your bad feelings. They say, ignore the past. Push it away. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying, don't pretend. I mean, who is that person? What real harm has that person called you? You do those two things. And then, number three, you move to cancel their debt. Cancel their debt. Oh, Brad, that's easier said than done. Yep, I, I, I'm not saying that. But understand, forgiveness is releasing a debt. That's what forgiveness is. By definition, it is legitimately releasing a debt. Now listen, when you do this, I'm not telling you to determine who's at fault. This isn't determining blame. And really it just means that when I cancel somebody's debt, I let go of my right to hurt that person back. I let go of my right to play that tit for tat game. You know what I'm talking about. Pain for pain, right? I let go of my plan to get even with that person. Basically, you're just saying, you don't owe me anymore. And when you say that, what you're saying is, I've decided this may never put things the way that I want them, but I release you from the obligation that you owe me, that you owe me. Now, if you're struggling with this, here's where I want you to follow me, okay? Okay. If you're struggling, maybe you're saying, yeah, Brad, you don't get it. They really owe me. I mean, they owe me. I know they owe you. But you know what? 
most of the time, those people can't pay you back anyway. So why do you keep rescinding your bitter collection notices to them, knowing that it's never going to get paid back? Think about it. Your father can't return your childhood. Many of our fathers are already dead and gone. They can't do that. And an apology doesn't erase the experience. So why keep holding on to it? It's only affecting us. It's only affecting you. Yeah, there we go. One person, thank you. One got that. If you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this. To forgive is to set the prisoner free and then discover that the prisoner was actually you. That's what freedom that's what choosing forgiveness is all about. And by the way, I'm not saying that forgiveness is easy. It's the opposite, right? I'm not saying that forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness costs God his son. Forgiveness costs Jesus his life. Forgiveness, it, it's going to cost you your pride. It's going to cost you a grudge. It's going to cost you that lecture that you've been writing in your mind that you're going to give to somebody. It, 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 but, but that's not what this is all about. You're saying, you know, I, 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 I don't want to forgive. But listen to this. God is not asking you to forgive that person because they deserve forgiveness. He's asking you to forgive them because he has forgiven you. That's the heart of forgiveness. Did you get that? See, forgiveness doesn't make any sense unless you've been forgiven. See, now there's a phrase in our culture that goes like this. Forgive and, let's say it again. Forgive and, that's not what the Bible teaches. Forgive and forget. It doesn't teach that. Look at Colossians chapter three. It says, make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Say the word with me. Remember. Say it again. Remember. The Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. See, it's the opposite of forgive and forget, isn't it? It's forgive and remember. Remember what? Not what that person's done to you. No. He said, remember what Jesus did for you on the cross. Don't you get it? He says, your debts were paid for. Jesus' death canceled the debt of sin and the grave. Jesus canceled everything. You remember that you and I don't deserve forgiveness. So why are we holding on to something when God has forgiven us so much when we don't deserve it? Whether you're clapping or not, this is good stuff. No, that's all right. No, no, I'm, I'm good about amening myself. That's fine. Don't worry about it. That's cheap. That's a way to get a cheap amen. But it's true. You know, the news, it's depressing, isn't it? You turn it on every day and you discover people who have done a lot of bad things. Why are they in the news? They're in the news because they've been caught. See, the rest of us in here, we haven't been caught. We have sinful thoughts. We do sinful actions. We're evil in so many different ways. And God looks down on his children who has a relationship with him. And he throws down this bucket of grace called forgiveness. And he washes me clean every single day. And he says, Brad, because you are in Christ, you're a new creation. You are changed. I look at you as changed now. And he says, all has passed away and all has come. He says, now that you've been changed, now start acting like it. Start changing some of those things in your life that you've been doing that I need you to do to enjoy the best life that I created for you. One of those things is start forgiving. If you don't start forgiving, things are going to get messed up. You're changed. The old is gone. The new has come. You choose it, man. You choose to change. He says you're forgiven, Brad. Not because you deserve it, but because I love you. Isn't that awesome? Maybe you didn't get that. I'm going to do that again. He looks down at my sinfulness that keeps me away from a perfect and holy God. 
And because I have a relationship with him and I put my faith in what Jesus did on the cross for me, he looks down at me and he says, Brad, you are forgiven. And he says the same to you if you are in Christ. You are forgiven. And that's the best news you've heard today right there. See the cross. The cross is the only place that forgiveness makes sense. See, I forgive not because that person deserves it, but because Jesus forgave me when I didn't deserve it. So here's how we're going to end this thing. Here's what I'm asking you to do today. We're winding down to the next holiday, 4th of July or whatever it is. All of this is going to be put to the test that we're talking about here today. I'm saying don't focus in that time with the person who hurt you, but focus on the one who paid the high price to forgive you. And I know that you can forgive that person. I know you can. And my prayer is that you will replace the I can't with the I will cancel their debt. And when you do, what happens is, let me just tell you, when you really forgive, and sometimes it's repetitive, sometimes you have to do it over and over, that what happens is that ugly part of your soul that's angry, that's trapped, that's fearful, it becomes unchained, and it becomes free. And then we get to live the most important way. We get to live the way that God intended for us to live. We are free to love God. And we are free to love others, but it happens when we let it go. I want you to stand to your feet as we close. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, God, that you've loved us so much, that you love us so much. And you're looking down in this room right now and you see people that you love so much that are going through such turmoil in their lives. And it breaks your heart because you, you don't want that for them. You've given them every opportunity and you continue to give them opportunities to make things right. There are so many in this room that are far from you. They need your forgiveness. And so God, I just pray in this moment, their hearts will be turned. That they will say, I want a God that loves me like that. Keep your heads bowed. If, if, if that's you, Maybe you're here and you say, Brad, that's what I want. I want a God that loves me like that, that forgives me when I don't deserve it. The Bible says that when we're still sinners, when we're at our ugliest, that's when Jesus actually died for us. He saw us that way. You say, Brad, I want Jesus. Maybe you're just away from him right now. Maybe you just, you just need forgiveness. And you say, Brad, I want you to pray for me today. Lift your hand right now. Lift your hand all over this room. Look at that. All over this room. Come on, lift your hand right now. All over this room. This is where it begins. Wow. Wow. In the balcony. Thank God. Thank God. This is awesome. I just want you to pray this prayer with me. We're all going to pray it together. So pray this with me. And if you pray this a minute in your heart, something happens right now. Let's just pray it. Just say, dear God, I thank you for Jesus for sending him to live the perfect life and to give his life so that I can know you. So today, I ask you to forgive me. I need you. I need your love. And I need that freedom in my life every day. Thank you for coming into my heart. I'm going to serve you every day in Jesus' name. I want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. So many of you, I know we're in this room. This was a message that was geared mainly towards believers. That's why it blows my mind that so many said, I'm away from God and I need him. But so many of you are in this room. You say, Brad, this is a word for me today. Pictures were coming to my mind. People were coming to my mind. People that I need to forgive. You know, there's a whole other sermon about asking people to forgive you. <laughs> you being on the other side. But most of us are on the side of somebody's hurt us. You can't make them come back and say, I'm sorry. But you just got to let it go. And some of you say, that's very difficult for me. I've got grudges. I've got anger. I've got hurt. 
and I need prayer because I want to let it go. If that's you today, I want to see your hand. I'm going to pray for you. We're all going to pray together. Let me see your hand. Come on, lift it up. I've got mine up. There's so many, so many, so many, so many. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, you see our hands. God, you see what we're going through. You see some of the hurt and some of the pain. Yeah, somebody did something wrong. Somebody hurt us. And they hurt us bad. But God, we need you today to come and just to pour that bucket of grace upon us. Pour that bucket of forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to be able to forgive just like you have forgiven us. So, Lord, we know what they owe us. We know what they've done. But today, Lord, help us as we forgive them. Because we want to be like Jesus, who forgave us when we didn't deserve it. We love you, Lord. And more than anything, we thank you today for your grace. Because it's your grace that makes it all right. In Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. Come on, sing with Adam. Sing with Adam at this time.